Well, I love this story of uh, George Braden. If you're familiar with any Alliance history at all, you read any of his story, he heard that the gospel was closed, or the Arab world was closed to the gospel. And when he heard that, it kind of burned in his heart, like it bothered him. He, George Braden was a guy who had this inheritance coming up. He, had, he was involved in this family that, I don't remember the business, but it was some big deal. He was going to inherit all this money and be a part of this wealthy empire, if you will. And, and the Lord told him to go to Arabia and bring the gospel. And he told his father, and his father said, you go there, I'm writing you out of the will. But he went, and he told his wife, he says, how would you like to open the door to Arabia? And she says, I thought you'd never ask. And they went, and you saw him in the video there, traveling by camel, bringing the gospel to people who had never heard the good news, and opening the door. And all these years later, we're seeing fruit from a, a man's faithfulness to go when God said to go in war-torn areas that now were, were there all these years later. Jesus drawing people to himself. I, I'm thankful that uh, our Alliance family, that we're, that we're there, that we're, uh, we're there and we're sharing the gospel to the ends of the earth. And the heartbeat of this movement really is that every tribe, tongue, nation, every people group would hear the good news. And so with tremendous danger and a whole lot of grit, these pioneer missionaries went and behind that was this unwavering faith, right? This understanding that Jesus is the only way. That's why they went. Because if there's other ways, then, then just do your own thing, right? But they were compelled by this love that they had for Jesus and love they had for people to let them know that there is a way to salvation through Christ, a relationship with the living God. Man has produced religion over the years and attempted to make sense of the human existence and failed in some key areas like how do you get order out of chaos? How do you find purpose in life? How do you find right and wrong? And how do you define that? How do you understand things like human suffering? Are we just accidentally here? And if so, then what do I have to look forward to? Why do I even bother? But to know that God designed us, that God loves us, that God calls us into a relationship with him, it changes our life. It changes how we live, how we think, how we do everything. It's a book I'm reading by Ravi Zacharias uh, called Jesus Among Secular Gods. And in that, he references a man by the name of F.W. Borum who wrote an uh, essay called A Baby's Funeral. And he tells this story about how he is noticing one day outside of his home this woman kind of pacing back and forth. And he goes out to greet her, and, and uh, she says, are you the pastor? And he says, yes, I am. And, and she uh, starts to tell her story. She has given birth to uh, a terribly deformed child. And, and, and a couple days later, this child has died. And she says to him, would you provide the burial? Would you help me bury my baby? But that wasn't all of it. She was ashamed. Because this baby was born illegitimately, didn't know who the father was, um, and, and yet the pastor agreed to help her. And so this day of burial comes, and it's dark, and it's raining, pouring rain, and there's this lonely scene as this poor woman buries her illegitimate child who was deformed at birth in a brand new cemetery that has never been used, of this little body being placed into this this hole in the ground there. A dark and lonely moment. She didn't have anybody else by her side. She was on her own. The pastor was there that she had just met and the grave digger, and that was it. And this is a lonely scene. But he realizes as he reflects on this scene that all these years later, that was a turning point in this woman's life. That she had, from that time on, had realized that Jesus was the only answer she had for her pain. And that there was nobody else in the world that was going to meet her in that suffering. Only him. And so she had walked with him ever since that day. A time when some maybe would say, ah, oh, forget God and do your own thing. No, she pressed in and she found a relationship with a living God. It's a powerful story, but it illustrates how God desires this relationship with you and with me. And our text this morning in Hebrews chapter 9 shows us how God desires relationship with us, how he has set it up and how he has constantly called people in and said, come and know me and be with me. 
Now, the context of this uh, chapter in Hebrews 9 is it something that's somewhat foreign to us. We don't have in our churches you know, this idea of the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant or this ritual and all these things, but we have Jesus and we have him in us and everywhere we go we have Jesus in us. But he calls us into relationship with the living God. So I, I want you to hear that no matter where you find yourself today, no matter if you feel worn out, lonely, you feel like that woman standing by the remains of your life or something terrible has happened, I want you to realize that Jesus provides a way to relationship with a living God, even you and people that you know and people that we love. Hebrews chapter 9, I want to read verse 1 through verse 14. So if you have your Bibles, you want to look at that or grab one under the chairs there, Hebrews 9 verse 1. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They were they are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Jesus, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, Cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. So what do we learn? Well, we learn that God wants us to approach him. He desires for that we approach him. My first job as a kid was a paper route. Um, Back when they actually did that. I don't know if they still even do that. Um, I delivered the Sheboygan Press after school every day. I got home and I got the papers and I went and did my paper route, and it took me about 45 minutes. I made like $5 a day. It was fantastic to do that. The challenge that I had, though, was this one house where this dog, Duke, hung out. And Duke was, as small town rumors go, a uh, dog that bit everyone. I mean, I, I was told everybody got bit by Duke. So I was naturally kind of not wanting to find out, so I learned uh, some tricks with Duke. I'd come into the driveway, and I'd say, hey, come here, you know, and he would have a little fit, and, and he'd bring me his ball eventually, and I would throw his ball as far as I could. And when he was gone, I would go to the door, put the paper in the door, and then he'd come back, and I'd throw the ball again, and I'd leave. Except those other those days when the ball wasn't to be found, or when um, Duke was not having any of it. And he'd stand between me and the house, and kind of like challenge me, like, hey, you gonna, you gonna come? You gonna do this? And I didn't know if he was serious or not. Like I said, small town rumors say, yeah, he's serious, he's gonna bite me, I'm gonna probably be dead. But um, he let me know that there was a barrier there, that I was not getting into that. That I needed to please him in order to to get into that place. And you know, I, I think I've been guilty of that with God before, and viewing God that same way, to, to say, well, if I do enough stuff, if I, if I behave a certain way, then, then God will let me have access to him. But if I mess it up, I'm in big trouble. But that's not a correct view of God at all. 
Sometimes we think that if we behave a certain way, if I go to church this many times, if I tithe, if I be nice to those grumpy neighbors of mine or my family members or whoever, then God will accept me. But oh, lest we forget the grace of God. That he doesn't wait for us to get things right. Isn't that great? That he didn't wait for us to figure it out and then came. He came in our mess while we were yet sinners. He came and met with us. It is a good thing. In Israel's, in Israel's history now, we had uh, slavery. We had uh, issues with uh, not living for God. And so they were captured and they were, put away, you know, they were having trouble. And, and God came and he delivered them and he gave them freedom. And God reminds them of his presence and he says, I'm with you. I've not forgotten you. Moses comes. Remember the story. Fast forward a bit. In the middle of Israel is this temple, this tabernacle, this place where they could go and they could meet with God. And there were different parts of this, as you saw in your text there. There was the outer courts, the outer areas where the average person could go. And then the priest would go into the holy place and would bring uh, the sacrifices of the day in there and they would tend to the various areas in the temple every day. And then you go further and you have the Holy of Holies or the most holy place, as it says in my, my text, and the high priest would go there once a year and offer the sacrifices of a nation. All the, the kind of the cleanse, the, 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 the slate, if you will, to get rid of those things that we didn't even think about confessing because they just weren't on our mind. But nobody else dared go in there because if you went in there, you would die. In that Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. Um, the tablets of the law were in there, Aaron's staff, and this... A uh, gold jar of manna, all those things showing the presence of God and how he had walked with them throughout many years. And on top of that ark was what was called the mercy seat or the atonement cover or the place where God was said to dwell and they would then bring the offering and offer it on that place. But here was the tension though. See, God was calling man to come and worship him and serve him, yet there was a barrier there. There was restricted access to God himself. Sinful people could not be tolerated in the presence of a holy God. And so he kept them at a distance and he made a, a, an avenue through these priests that would offer the sacrifices. But see, the core of this tabernacle work, though, was this question, and a significant religious question. And that is, how can I become acceptable to God? And the law told them that the Messiah would come and would save them and that they were not acceptable to God. They needed to be, to be changed, needed to be forgiven. Their hearts were sinful. Their actions were rebellious. They were selfish. They could not be near God. Yet all that was being done in the temple, the tabernacle there, was to make them acceptable to God. That was what they were trying to do. The priests did all that they could to try to make that happen. In verse 7 it says, But only the high priest entered the inner room, and only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. Do you see what it's saying about the responsibility that we have for our sin? That sin is unacceptable to God, even if you don't know it's sin. Someone still needed to be held accountable for the sins that were done in ignorance. How will we ever be acceptable to God if that's the case? In order to make that happen, we see this blood needed to be shed. Because sin is a barrier to approaching God. The desire that God had for having us approach him was disrupted by sin. And all the sacrifices and and all that they did with the blood of the goats and the heifers and all these things that they did were trying to deal with the pervasiveness of sin. And you know, sin's disruptive to a relationship with God today. That's why we're told to confess our sins and that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But people were to approach God, it says here, but they approached him with, with blood. Never, it says in verse 7, without blood. They always came with blood. Because God is holy and God is untainted by evil. And death was a requirement for sin. So every time, think about it like this, and every time they brought this blood sacrifice, I mean, they felt the, 
the heinousness and the, the guilt and the dirtiness of their sin because blood was literally being shed and it was a bloody area. I don't know if we always get the same view of sin today. We, we disconnect sometimes from what, how we should view sin. We should really understand sin as dangerous to us as well as absolutely uh, devastating to us. In fact, Paul wrote in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 12 and verse 13, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. Oh, probably a big deal. Listen to that, right? You will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. We need to have that same view of sin, that death is still the requirement, even if we're not constantly spilling all this blood all over the place. we still got to understand that if you, if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But there's been disruptions ever since Adam and Eve decided to disobey God. Because God said to them, what? If, I, if you eat this, you will die. Okay, they ate it. Guess what? They died. He told them. We're warned today that we need to follow God, obey his word, seek his kingdom, seek his righteousness, because if we're left to our own ideas and our own feelings, we will sin and we will die. Some of those are literal consequences for our sin on our physical bodies that we die from, and some of those are spiritual consequences of sin that we die eternally from unless they're paid for by Jesus on our behalf. So we take sin seriously. Root it out. Get rid of it. Let the light of Christ shine in your heart and get rid of those things because they're doing you no good. I was outside last weekend pretending that it was spring, uh, cutting branches, you know, like pretending that it was going to grow. <laughs> There's a vine uh, along our fence uh, in our backyard and I was cutting this thing down and I was struggling with this thing. I mean, it is tangled in everything and up in the trees and it's wrapped around stuff and it's got little prickly things on it and uh, you have to pull hard, you have to cut, and you have to pull again and I thought, boy, you know, this thing is sure, uh, this thing is sure really pervasive in this tree and really, really uh, tangling everything up. And you know, it's a really good illustration if you pay attention to some of these things <laughs> of sin, right? Because it starts very small and very subtly and grows very nicely. It looks all nice there. And then it starts to wrap itself around and wrap itself around. And before you know it, you're all tangled up in this tyranny of the vine, this, this sin that wraps around everything. And now you've got to cut it out. Well, that's a lot more painful. But I thought, boy, the experience we have is the same. We get all tangled up in our sin. And Jesus comes and and the only difference we have is that Jesus takes care of that sin. He untangles us. He gets rid of it. He cuts it out. It's painful, too. It can be difficult, too. But all the work he did on our behalf on the cross is that we can be offered forgiveness and freedom from our sin. The tabernacle here was incomplete in that sense because sin had more of an effect than just the physical, the outside. He says here that sin had left a stain on the conscience. That stain keeps reminding us of our sin over and over again. No matter what they did, that stain was never gone. And so the second question being asked is, how can I approach God when I'm so unclean? The blood reminded them that they are not clean. The tabernacle amplified that there's a space between God and man and there needs to be a way in there. And of course, they had examples of the holiness of God and how people had misunderstood it and misapplied it and overstepped their bounds and were killed as a result. One example is this story in Leviticus chapter 10 where Aaron's sons, Aaron the priest, okay, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them and added incense and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them and they died. Before the Lord. I don't know how matter of fact that is. You know, like, like it just kind of happened. And then they, they, Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will show myself holy. In the sight of the people, I will be honored. And Aaron, it says, remained silent. What could you say? In, in light of the holiness of God, and the misunderstanding of the holiness of God, 
That's what was going to happen. God deals appropriately with sin. But this is what weighs on us at some point in our life, and maybe you've been there before where you've experienced that and you've seen how ultimately God draws us into a relationship with him and lets us know that we have sin and that he has a remedy for that sin. And if I can embrace Christ, I can be forgiven and I can get myself out of that hole that I've dug. Not by digging farther, not by trying to win favor with God, not by trying to tip the scale, but accepting Jesus as my Savior and what he has done for me so that I can, inside of my heart and my life, scream, I'm free. I've been free. I'm no longer tangled up by my sin or oppression or or the weight of it all. I'm free. That's what he's teaching us. That's what he's doing in bringing us in. I can be cleansed at the heart level. See, the problem with the old way was in verse 9. He says the sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. The old way didn't deal with the heart. The sin and death and condemnation had captured and kidnapped people and no one could escape them. They needed a savior. No matter what you do, there was always more. Religion had no way to deal with sin. You needed a savior to do that. Jesus Christ did that for us. And so here's where it ends. It ends here. Jesus Christ cleanses our heart where sin exists, actually, not on the outside, but the inside. We're cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Verse 12, he did not enter by means of blood of goats or calves, but, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood. He enters by his own blood. And when he goes in, that veil, that separation between God and us is torn, is broken, and we now have access to God. It's a wonderful reminder because there's so many hard hearts. You probably know people you've been praying for and you're asking God to soften their hearts, soften their hearts so that they can hear. You might be angry with God yourself. You might be keeping God at arm's length, something that's happened to you. But it says here there's a heavenly sanctuary where Christ himself purifies us. Even down to those deep, dark, and lonely places that Christ purifies, cleanses, sets us free. The blood of Jesus is accepted as a covering for your sin if you accept Jesus as your Savior. He says also we're given peace, we're given life, verse 14 that's why we, why do we need a cleansed conscience? Because guilt will lead us to destructive choices and we, many people will try to self-medicate or deal with the pain and regret of life. But you receive Jesus and you can be forgiven, cleansed. Peace can come into your heart. Peace with God, peace with others, peace with yourself. Sometimes we're hard on ourselves, aren't we? There's no longer a soul that's, that's looking for something to fill it, but we have found what we need, a relationship with a living God that we were made for. He made us for that. And now today, we don't have the tabernacle anymore, but we have Christ who dwells in us, that we are his sanctuary, we are his temple, that he dwells in us. Paul wrote about this, Ephesians chapter 3, 16 and 17, I pray that out of the glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts that he may literally take up residence inside of you and live in your, in your heart, in your life, in your soul, and, and work through you. That you can go anywhere you go and you can worship him. You can be with him anywhere you are because he dwells with you. But notice how this also changes us back in verse 14, the last part of verse 14. Last, he says, so that all that stuff takes place now, and he changes our life, he clears our conscience, so that we may serve the living God. You see how that changes us? We serve a living God joyfully in relationship versus some sort of statue or ideas that the priest might tell us. We have a living God, a living Savior, who we're put on mission with today, that we can live and do and be a part of today. It happens in our homes, in our communities, in our churches, in our world, all over the place that we're seeing God call us to serve in his kingdom and his work. It's exciting. It should inspire some passion inside of us that when we come to something like Awana on Wednesday nights that we're excited because people get to hear the good news. How wonderful is that? This is not boring, empty religion, but it's a real relationship with a living Jesus Christ who brings us into that throne room of God. 
So the two questions we ask then, how can I become acceptable to God? And how can I approach God when I'm so unclean? The answer is found in Jesus Christ. That he is after your heart. That the only way to relationship with God is through Jesus Christ. And that's it. It doesn't make us closed-minded. It, it, it's how God has set it up. It's how God has arranged this. That there's one appointed way. And we're thankful there is even one way. Because he wouldn't have had to do that either. So religion has not figured out how to deal with sin. Only, like it says here, peripheral matters. But Jesus takes care of that heart. And we can worship God through Christ our life and come to him and clear our conscience because of all he has done. And so are you carrying a load of guilt today? Are you feeling the weight of your sin? Are you tied up in circumstances and looking for a fresh start? My encouragement to you is to come to Jesus. Reach out and grab onto him. Because he is available, open arms, ready to receive you and to come into your life if you surrender to him. He takes care of your sin. You might ask, well, how do I do that? Well, Scripture says we come by faith. We, but we call on his name, we believe in him. And when we do that, we're changed inside. We're given new life. But I've also met my fair share of worn-out believers, people who have trusted in Jesus and walked with him for some time and then have gotten tired, worn out. Life has gotten in the way. Things have happened. Things have not gone how we thought they would and maybe you're there. And maybe this is a call to say, you know what, I want to I go back and I want to grab on to who Christ is for me. And I want to tell him I'm, I'm grabbing on to him and I'm not letting go and I'm going to untangle from these things that have gotten a hold of me and I'm going to grab on to you today because he loves you. So as we, we go to the prayer here, I, I invite you to reflect on that and just ask the Lord to shine that light on your heart today. Where are you at in this? Do you, do you know him? Do you have a relationship with God? Or do you not? And if you don't, would today be the day when you would say, yes, Jesus, I want to receive you. I want to believe in you. I want a relationship with you. A real one, not, not, this, not this religious stuff, but the real thing that you would change my life and forgive my sin and set me free. So let's go before the Lord together. Just take a moment in, in silence and reflection and, and be honest. If you are looking to trust in him today, you can simply tell him that, Jesus, I believe. I want to receive you as my Savior. You are my Lord, and I turn from my sin, and I embrace you, the forgiveness and the life you give. He takes us up on that when we do that. Same thing for those who maybe are, for years, been walking with, with the Lord but are just struggling today, and you can come back and say, Jesus, I'm, I'm in. <clears throat> Father, we celebrate all that you've accomplished. It's no longer all these religious acts that we saw in the tabernacle, but, but all has been fulfilled, and we have a living Savior that we enter into relationship with. That we can come to, to know and we can experience fullness of life even in the midst of darkness and lonely times. To know that you are there, you are with us, that you are alive, providing hope. Today I pray for the, those in, in this room today who are considering what it means to follow you. I pray for those who maybe are saying in their hearts today, yes, I believe, yes, I want to believe, I've never trusted, I want to trust you today. That you would receive what they are offering and you would encourage them in their hearts today. Even to reach out to somebody else and to, to, to be encouraged in that new life found in Christ. And Lord, for others who maybe are struggling with something and are looking to you for answer, looking to you for hope, to know that only Jesus is the answer. He's the only way. So, Lord, we cast aside those other things and we put our faith and our hope completely in you. Untangle those things that are tangling us up. Help us run with passion, run with, with fire, with excitement to you and what you've done. We love you, Lord. We are so grateful. We want to praise your name for all that you've done. You're so good to us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
We're going to conclude our service.